Good evening to you tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open up in your Old Testaments to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 21. That is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study this evening. This is where we left off last week, and it provides just a perfect segue into this evening's study. So Judges chapter 21, and we'll be looking at the very last verse there in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 21. In verse 25. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thanks for having your Bible with you. Let's open up our Bibles for a few moments and study about God, study about His Word, specifically study from our Old Testaments tonight as we learn how we as New Testament Christians can better appreciate, better understand, and better apply the lessons and the stories that we read about in our Old Testaments. We have been looking at a total of 10, so we're up to number 8 tonight. We've got two more, and then we're done with this series. We looked at the creation, we looked at the fall, we looked at the exodus, the law, Israel going into the land of Canaan, and tonight we're talking about a man after God's own heart. But the story of this man after God's own heart begins here in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, long before this man was ever born. We left off Israel entering into the, Canaan land, uh, into the land of Canaan, getting the possession that God had promised them. But they didn't drive out all the nations like they were supposed to. There were going to be problems because of the nations that they left behind in the land. The book of Judges records this period of time where Israel uh, had the land but fell away from God. They would go off into captivity. They would find themselves as it were. They would humble themselves in repentance towards God. God would raise up a deliverer for them from among the people, commonly called a judge. And this judge would deliver Israel from Moab, from Philistia, and then he would or she would rule over the people for a period of time, usually somewhere around 40 years, uh, before the cycle kind of repeated itself. And if the book of Judges is any indication, there in chapter 21 and verse 25, we get a summary statement for life under the judges, and it is this. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That is a very, very condemning statement, isn't it? It's factually correct in one way. There was no king in Israel at this time, was there? Uh, because if, if you're familiar with your Bible history, the first king Israel is going to have is going to be Saul. But Saul hadn't even been born yet. And so there is a factual way in which it is right that there was no king in Israel. Everyone did just what was right in their own eyes. But there's going to be another way in which there was no king in Israel, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Flip over with me to the book of 1 Samuel. Joshua, Judges, skip over Ruth. Not because Ruth is unimportant, but we just don't have time to get into Ruth tonight. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we are nearing the end of this period of the judges. We've had Samson as a judge. We commonly talk about Eli and Samuel being judges, whether you want to consider them judges or not. That's a different discussion for another time. But what is not up for debate is the reality that Eli's sons were wicked. And these were seen by many to be the next leaders in Israel. But Eli, for as righteous as he might have been, in, in chapter 2 and verse 12 of 1 Samuel, we find out the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. There's not a whole lot of people in Scripture that are called worthless. And when God in heaven looks down in all of his mercy and looks at a couple of guys and says they are worthless, we ought to take note of that. There's something to be said there. There's something for us to see there. And as dark as the picture may be, there is something for us to appreciate there. To appreciate that these men were not fit for leadership, that these men were not fit to, guard, uh, to, to guide rather God's people. Uh, they perverted the service of the sacrifices. Uh, there was indication that they were sexually immoral. And so it's no surprise that Samuel starts to get center stage here because the sons of wicked, uh, the sons of Eli rather, 
were so exceptionally wicked. Samuel is going to have issues with his sons too. And so we skip over then to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Eli's sons are not fit to lead. Samuel is not fit to lead. His sons are not fit to lead. And it came about in chapter 8 and verse 1, when Samuel was old, that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. And then all the elders of Israel gathered together to Samuel at Ramah. And they said, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint us a king for us to judge us, that we might be like all the other nations. Judges 21 and 25. There was no king in Israel that day. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Israel comes to Samuel in 1 Samuel 8 and says, hey, give us a king. Give us a king that we might be like the other nations around us. Verse 6, this was displeasing to Samuel. It was displeasing to the Lord. But listen to what God says. If this is what the people want, this is what we're going to give them. They can have their king. But Samuel, don't take this to heart. The end of verse 7, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. Don't miss this point. Israel always had a king. That king was Jehovah. But when we read in Judges 21 and verse 25 that there was no king in Israel that day, everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. While that is a statement of fact because you didn't have the, the kingship yet, you didn't have the throne yet, it's also true because Israel had turned away from God. And functionally there was no king in Israel because everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes and they weren't listening to the law and they weren't listening to God. Israel makes the demand here in verse 8, give us a king, give us a king that we might be like all the other nations. And boy, if there's a disappointing, disappointing statement, it's that one. Israel was never supposed to be like the other nations. God had called them out of the other nations to be a holy nation separate to him. They didn't begin like any other nation. They weren't to live like all the other nations. And their end was not supposed to be like all of the other nations. But they decided, they decided to be like all of the other nations. God says, I'll give you a king. He warns them about a king, just like he had warned in times past. They want the king. They're going to get the king. And the king that they're going to get is somebody who seems to fit the bill. He's... He's statuesque. He is a, a man's man. He is what you would think of if you're drawing up what a king looks like in your mind. It's going to be Saul. Head and shoulders above all of the people of Israel. He is one who went out and led the armies of Israel. He is appointed as the first king over Israel. But time is going to go by and very quickly we find out Saul is not who we think he is. He isn't the one that we wanted. He isn't the one that we needed. 1 Samuel chapter 13 records Saul making the poor decision to offer a sacrifice to God uh, that he had not been commanded to do, that he was not authorized to do. And that's where we read this in 1 Samuel 13 and verses 13 and 14, which Josh did such a good job reading for us just a few moments ago. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now the kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as a ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul was going to be replaced. Replaced by a man after God's own heart. If that doesn't seal it for us in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we find for certain that Saul is going to be rejected. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, when he was told to destroy Amalek, utterly destroy Amalek, Saul didn't. He spared the king. He spared some of the choices of the flocks. Uh, eventually he confesses to Samuel in verse 24 that I have sinned, I have indeed transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Pardon my sin, verse 25, that I may worship the Lord. 
Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you because you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. The Lord has torn the kingdom, verse 28, of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Saul is rejected from being king over Israel. And it's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that the sons of Jesse are paraded in front of Samuel. The man after God's own heart is anointed to be the next king over Israel, and that's going to be David. And as we make our way over eventually to 2 Samuel chapter 5, that is when David is going to be installed as the king over Israel and Judah. He reigns uh, for years, for decades, over the nation there before eventually giving way to his son Solomon. That is a very, very quick run through in eight minutes of a whole lot of Bible history, and I get that. But as always, we're trying to make this point. How does does this message come out to us in the New Testament? Three main points I want us to see. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start with the same point that we have seen in every one of these character studies from the Old Testament all along, and that is this, that when we are looking at these Old Testament figures, Over and over and over again, what we are seeing is a picture of faith. God has always expected his people to have faith. Even in the Old Testament times, when people like to talk about the the law of Moses being a, a more formal and ritualistic type of religion, the reality is God was not simply and only concerned with the outward in the law of Moses. Just as much as there were outward responsibilities in the law of Moses, there was also the necessity of men and women having faith, having a heartfelt, deep, sincere faith. God has always required man's heart. In fact, when we read to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that Jesus is going to repeat over and over in the new covenant, where's that drawn from? drawn from the pages of the Old Testament, drawn from the pages of the law of Moses. God has always required his people to serve him from the heart. God has always required that his servants have faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. So if we're going to please God, we've got to have faith. And one of the key men who exercised faith and is an example of faith to us is David. Look at first Samuel, or Hebrews rather, chapter 11 and verse 32. We mentioned these, these nameless individuals in the book of Hebrews this morning. You get down here to verse 32, and the writer of Hebrews says, there, there's still more people. Time fails me. What more shall I say? Time will fail me if, if I tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained Promises shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Who is that talking about? Others were tortured, not accepting their release. Who is that talking about? So that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings. Who is that talking about? Also chains and imprisonment. Who is that talking about? They were stoned. Who was that in the Old Testament? They were sawn in two. Who was that in the Old Testament? Maybe Isaiah, but we don't know for sure. They were tempted. They were put to the death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute. Who's that talking about? Afflicted and ill-treated men of whom the world was not worthy. And in that entire list, whose name did we catch? David's. Shutting the mouths of lions, that's often thought of as a reference to Daniel being thrown into the lion's den and coming out unharmed. But we're also going to remember that David in his work as a shepherd faced down a lion and a bear and came through it unscathed. Perhaps there's a reference there. Perhaps there's a reference to the many times that David had the opportunity to take the life of Saul, but he did not. And Saul had opportunity after opportunity to take the life of David, but somehow David escaped. Nonetheless, the Hebrew writer will hold up to us, David, as this great picture of faith. Faith in God. Faith in a God of promises. 
Faith in a God who forgives. How could we miss David's words in the 32nd Psalm? About a God who forgives and the confidence that David had in a God who forgives. David is held up for us throughout the New Testament as a picture of faith. And that's how the story of the man after God's own heart becomes significant in our lives today. But here's, here's another one. I want you to look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And these last two points are really where we want to spend a little bit of time this evening. Perhaps uh, because these are phrases that we have heard through our lives, but maybe never explored them to any degree of depth. And we're going to try to do that just in a few moments this evening. Luke chapter 1, and I want you to look over here at verse, verses 31 and 32. This is a message that is going to be given to, to Mary. The angel Gabriel comes and gives a message to Mary in verse 28, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. She's perplexed, trying to figure out what's going on here. The angel reassures her in verse 30, Don't be afraid, you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Catch that. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. Look over at Acts chapter 2, if you would. Acts chapter 2. So Gabriel promises Mary that the child that you will give birth to, Jesus the Lord, Emmanuel, he will be given the throne of his father David. In Acts chapter 2, as, as Peter is talking about the resurrection of Jesus and talking about Jesus as being the Messiah being the Christ, being the Lord over all. In verse 24, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it, was, since it was impossible for him to be held by death. And David says of Jesus, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness. Now, verse 29, Peter says this, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb is with us this day. The point of what Peter says there in verse 29 is a summary to verses 25 through 28. Peter quotes what David wrote in the Psalms years and years and years ago. And David writing here about... Not abandoning my soul to Hades, not allowing your Holy One to undergo decay. But then Peter points over here and says, hey, here's David's tomb. And his tomb is with us to this day. And we can go dig up that tomb or we can go open that tomb and what are we going to find in there? The decayed bones of David. But David said here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. What's the consequence there? What's the logical consequence? That David was not talking about whom? wasn't talking about himself. Well, then who was he talking about? And that's what Peter's answering here. Verse 30, and so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead, in that Old Testament quotation, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. Verse 32, this Jesus God has raised up. So David wasn't ever talking about himself. Who was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus. And the promise to David about Jesus was what? God had sworn to him an oath, verse 30, to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Or Luke chapter 1, I will give you the throne of your father, David. Matthew chapter 1 uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. The promise that was made to David, repeated in the New Testament, was that one of his descendants would be raised up to sit on his throne. 
that's a promise. If, if you want to hold your marker here in the New Testament and go to the Old Testament, look at Psalm 89. This is a promise that we find in the Old Testament. Psalm 89 in verses 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your seed forever, and I will build up your throne to all generations. Uh, There's also a a, a few pages over to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7, there's this promise. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So we see two clear Old Testament prophecies about someone from David's lineage being set up on his throne forever. We see the angel Gabriel in Luke 1 taking those prophecies and saying this is about Jesus. And then Acts 2, after Jesus has died and been raised and ascended into heaven, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes those prophecies and says what? These are all talking about Jesus, and Jesus sat on the throne of his father David when he was resurrected and ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God on high. Now, while we have mapped it out, we haven't yet come to an understanding, though, about what does it mean, right? What does it mean that Jesus has sat down at the throne of his father David? You'll notice that this promise always is spoken of in a context of Jewish hearers. It would be a message that was appreciated by people who were of Jewish descent. It's a strong ruler, a ruler from humble origins who led the nation bravely, a man who was after God's own heart and who in 1 Kings 11 and verse 4 fully followed the Lord his God. You look at the history of Israel with all of the different kings that she had, From Saul to David to Solomon and then the divided kingdom and the north never having a good king and the south only having a few good kings. You could really appreciate, if you were a Jewish hearer, you could really appreciate the notion of having a godly king. But when you and I hear the word king today, what do we think of? We think that's the Brits and we kicked them out around about 1776 and we don't want to have anything to do with the monarchy, right? George III, he he was a tyrant, right? No taxation without representation. We don't like kings because we're Americans, right? Okay, we get a few smiles there. I'm glad, all right? We're not getting political here. But that's just kind of ingrained in our psyche as Americans, right? We have been raised to understand that kings are what? Kings are bad. Kings are tyrants. And we don't have an appreciation for kings. And I get that. This is something living in 21st century America. This is where we have a breakdown with the biblical text that we have to work to get over. Because kings can be good. And especially the king who's sitting on David's throne. Which that's the imagery here. The imagery here is one Jesus who has been raised from the dead and is now seated on the throne. To describe Jesus as seated as David's throne is to identify Jesus as the Messiah. That's the Isaiah 9 passage that we just read. That's a messianic prophecy. And when we find the one who was seated on David's throne, we have found the Messiah. Well, when Peter tells us that Jesus is seated seated on David's throne, that is Peter telling us that Jesus is whom? Jesus is the Christ, which again is that message that would resonate with the Jewish hearers. But Jesus is the king. That's the point for us today. He rules and he reigns. He is Lord like we talked about this morning. 
We've been raised to rebuff the idea of a king because kings are tyrants. Because kings care only for themselves. Because kings are not involved in the lives of the common people. Because kings are in their ivory palaces. And they don't understand what life is like as a commoner. But when you look at Jesus, especially Jesus as it's described as being, being on David's throne, you couldn't much find a better king than what you would see in David. And when we think about David, there's no doubt we think about the big sin, right? We, we think about his sin with Bathsheba. But how many kings do you know who would commit a sin and be, in, be as open and as honest with their apology as David was? And not just giving the mea culpa in front of the cameras and doing the lip-sucking thing, you know, when you're trying to feign emotion. But being honest and embracing that he had sinned, that he had fallen, that he had made the poor choice, but that he was going to do better and he did do better. Imagine having a king, though, who had never sinned, yet could understand perfectly what it's like to be tempted. Imagine having a king who always did what was right and good. Imagine having a king described as the embodiment of grace and truth. And as close as David was to all of that, that's exactly what Jesus is. That's our king. When we read about Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David, it's a reference to Jesus being the king. But Jesus being a king that surpasses even the ideal of David. What the Jews would have thought of when they heard of David the king is surpassed by Jesus the king. We look at Jesus as our king and we see the perfect, most desirable king that there ever could be. A gracious, truthful, upright, honest, gracious But then there's another phrase that we see that ties together Jesus and David. Look at Acts chapter 13. This will be the last one we look at. Look at Acts chapter 13. And this is a phrase that has given me trouble for as long as I can remember, and I don't suppose that I have every answer but I have some things for us to chew on. And you can take it home and chew on it. And then you can come tell me where I'm right and where I'm wrong. All right? Acts chapter 13 and verse 34. We get this unique statement here. You have Paul preaching here. And in verse 34... As for the fact that God raised Jesus up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken of it in this way. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now what in the world does that mean? The sure mercies of David. And, and why, why would Jesus need to be given anything? Much less, why would he need to be given the sure mercies of David? Note that this is a, an Old Testament reference, too. And we'll go back to Isaiah 55. You can be flipping over there if you want to. That's where we're going to look in just a moment. Isaiah chapter 55. But notice this, that there is certainly some relationship between the sure mercies of David and the throne of David. The event that sees Jesus seated on the throne of David in Acts 2 is the resurrection. 
And that is the event that's being described in Acts 13, verse 34, as the sure mercies of David. So somehow there is a relationship between the sure mercies of David and the throne of David. There is a definite relationship between the sure mercies of David and the resurrection of Jesus. So whatever we understand about the sure mercies of David, it is wrapped up in the resurrection of Jesus. It's through the resurrection that Jesus came to sit on the throne, and that was a promise that God had made in the Old Testament in Isaiah 89. And from that throne, as you look at Isaiah 55, from that throne, Jesus would rule over his people, and he would, as you look there at verse 5, he would call all men unto himself. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Go back to verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to all the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. And then verse 5, he will call a nation. He's going to call all people to himself. That's a reference to the Gentiles. Or look at verse 7. So, uh, verse 6, seek the Lord while he might be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, let the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him return to the Lord. And in verse 7, he will have compassion on him and our God because he will abundantly pardon. So here is Jesus on the throne calling all people to himself and pardoning sin. So ask yourself, what are the sure mercies of David? They're the promises made to David that are fulfilled in Jesus. What are the sure mercies? That's why if you're reading from the New International Version or the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it's going to call these the sure mercies that were promised to David. Promised to David and ultimately fulfilled and experienced in Jesus. The things that God had promised to David that were eventually fulfilled in Jesus. Those are the sure mercies of David. The idea that Jesus would die, but then be raised powerful over death. The fact that he is Lord, the government being upon his shoulders there in Isaiah chapter 9. But maybe this one most practical to us, look at Psalm 40. Psalm 40 and verse 6, David will write and say this, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God, your law is within my heart. Now, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, remember that's written by David. Now, come over to here to Hebrews chapter 10. And you come to Hebrews chapter 10 in your New Testament. And look over here at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 actually start in verse 4. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4, we find out it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So therefore, verse 5, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. After saying sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first that he might establish the second. Now David's the one who wrote all that. But look at verse 10. David wasn't writing of himself, though. Who was David writing about? These are the sure mercies of David. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, For by one offering... He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In verse 18, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. What are the sure mercies of David? 
the promises made to David that are bound up in Jesus Christ, Jesus being our Lord, Jesus dying and being raised from the dead, and the forgiveness and the mercy that is available to us in Jesus Christ, which is what Psalm 40 is prophesying about and what Hebrews 10 explains to us. What do we see in David? We see a picture of faith. We see a picture of a king. And we see promises made by a faithful God that were fulfilled in the sending of his only son, raising him from the dead, and through him granting us life, granting us grace, granting us mercy. If you've never come to Jesus Christ, if you've never experienced the mercies of David that are available in Jesus Christ, you have that opportunity tonight. That's why Jesus came. That's why he sacrificed himself so that you and I could be made whole. If you have never come to Jesus Christ, if you need to be washed in his blood for the forgiveness of your sins, maybe as a Christian you haven't been living as you should and you need to make some changes, we want to help you do that. If we can help you tonight in any way, would you come while we stand and while we sing?